Hello everyone, this is Friar Rick and I'm Adam Michael Berger, Director of Evangelization here at Assumption. Welcome back for another session of Tao Talks. Today we're going to be talking about something that's uh, near and dear to Adam and me um, and it's a, a, a delicate topic, basically uh, living and loving people with addictions uh, in our lives. And so um, maybe we can begin by just talking about how we've been affected by it and our own little story and then uh, Maybe we'll talk a, a bit about addiction in general and uh, our response to how do you live in a healthy way with that. Um, we, th we thought about this topic uh, in August because it's the feast of St. Maximilian Kolbe. It was on the 14th and St. Maximilian Kolbe is the patron saint of people with addictions. When he was in Auschwitz in the concentration camp, they tried to starve him to death and it's a long story but he wouldn't die and so they they injected him with a poison to kill him mm -hmm. and so that injection made him um, the patron saint of people with addictions and that's certainly a reality that is very um, prevalent here in central new york but also uh, across the, the continent and the world really uh, addiction to opioids addiction to heroin and different types of addiction alcoholism still is um, but most of the time I hear from people who love someone who has a, an addiction and they don't know what to do. Uh, my story begins back in the um, mid-90s. Uh, I was working in Toronto as a friar, as a priest, and I was running a, a charity. And uh, I was surrounded by mostly employees who were in their mid to late 70s. And so, and I was in my 40s. And um, they were really not up to date with a lot of technology and stuff. And I found it very boring. Anyways, um, long story short, uh, uh, one of my employees introduced me to this gentleman who was very technically savvy. Uh, his name was Rob. I hired him right away. He was excellent. Um, and he happened to be exactly my age. So it turned out to be a lot of fun because it was finally somebody my age in the office. Um, he was a great employee and uh, solved a lot of our technolo technology problems. What I didn't know at the time was that he was a cocaine addict and he had been in recovery but like many people struggled and slipped and what happened was he stole money from the charity and when I discovered it I was like very upset uh, that I took it as an affront to me mm -hmm. you know. Um, but I was more concerned also about him and what was going on. And so um, I, I asked him to repay the money, which he did right away. And he started going for, for counseling and therapy and 12 step and, um, and then asked him to um, also prove that he was clean at work. So he had to bring in uh, what they called urine tests so results to show that his, blood, his urine was clean of, of cocaine. Uh, and in time, he, um, he did it again, believe it or not, and uh, he ended up getting fired. And actually, I got fired from my job uh, as head of this uh, uh, charity. And that's rare for uh, a friar to get fired from their job. But uh, the leadership of the friars are very concerned about me. They were concerned about him, too, but he had to work on his own stuff. Uh, but they were concerned that I was getting caught up in... Uh, rescuing him because he would go off on binges and I would be in my car searching for him in Toronto. Can you imagine? I mean, Toronto is a city of five million people um, and I'm like a maniac trying to help him, rescue him, fix him and I started losing it. I started losing myself in the process. Um, there were days that I would be like waiting for the shoe to fall. What's going to happen today? And whether I was going to have a good day or a bad day, depending on what he did. Mm -hmm. And so the friars had the, the insight to say, okay, you're, you're out of control. You need to work on your own stuff. And which I did. I ended up going to some meetings of a group called Codependence Anonymous and um, got to learn a lot more about myself. And as I got better, I discovered that um, I was drawn to helping people and a lot of people who are in um, ministry or other professions of caring like nursing, doctors, therapists are what we call adult children of alcoholics and um, 
they have a, a predisposition towards nurturing and helping others, which is really good, mm -hmm. blessing. But if it's if it's not really dealt with and you don't deal with the origins of it, it can get out of hand. So as I grew, um, I decided that like most people who are a little bit nutty, I went and got a degree in counseling. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to Loyola in Maryland and studied under the great uh, Robert J. Wicks, uh, one of my inspirations, um, and learned a lot about myself and also how to be a, a more effective pastoral minister. Um, and during that time, what I discovered was the origins of that issue in myself. Uh, nobody in my family was alcoholic, um, but my father, who is my hero and a wonderful man, in his youth um, had a very bad temper problem. Um, he was not violent per se, but he was very explosive in his, in his temperament. So one day, one moment, he'd be just fine. Uh, he was always a little bit of a terrorist. I mean, he wanted things his way. He was a control freak. We could all live with that. But what would happen is that sometimes he would just fly off the ha handle and you didn't know what you were dealing with. He'd go in a rage, absolute rage, and uh, yell and scream. And uh, my poor sisters um, had to deal with some of that, my older sister especially, and me. Um, my younger sister was really better at managing that, actually. She was, maybe he mellowed by then. But um, what it taught me, and my mother was caught up in that, and she would say, like, don't make him angry. You know, don't disturb him. Don't do this, don't do that. Try to, try to walk around the house, like on eggshells, making sure my father wouldn't fly off the handle, wouldn't explode. And it taught me a couple of things, right? It taught me to swallow my feelings, not to acknowledge what was happening, not to speak up for myself, but also to, in a way, um, think of this behavior as normal, mm -hmm. which it wasn't, right? And this is what life is like. And, um, and life is all about coasting these people and trying to help them so that they don't go out of, out of, you know, out of control and also supporting my mom. Um, and it was in, in both in my own therapy um, and in my study of counseling that I realized that's a lot of the origin of my codependency. Part of it is just my personality and um, how I was raised, but a lot of it was that sense of uh, reaction to my father. Uh, like I said, he, he mellowed a lot and he became a much more normal guy, more or less. There were times where, and I matured too, and what happened was he would do the same stuff and it would like push my buttons, but what I learned was just because somebody knows the, bus the buttons to push on you doesn't mean you have to react. Mm. You can actually take the wire out of the button and they can push that button all they want. The, re the, the wire is no longer there. And you can say, okay, nice try, but I'm not falling for it. And I, I'm not gonna react this way. If you wanna pull the stunt, that's your problem, but I'm not. And so that helped me tremendously in ministry and it freed me up to in, to do counseling and to help people and not get sucked into their problems. Uh, I, their problems did not become my problems. They're, they were them and I was me. And that was such a relief. Um, and my friend Rob eventually died from, from an overdose, um, the complications of an overdose. And that was very tragic, but I gotta tell you when he died, it was I hate to say it, but it was a relief mm -hmm. that that roller coaster was ending. Um, since then, I've been pretty good with that. Um, there are moments where I get a little bit nutty, kind of codependent. Um, I do have a friend right now who's a, who's an active drug addict and who's struggling really hard to to stay clean. and uh, And I've tried to be supportive. And uh, lately, I've had to say it to him because he was, in some ways, insinuating that he was going to go for therapy or treatment or whatever or rehab to please me and I'm like oh hell no excuse the language <laughs> do not do this for me it's not about me it's about you and that's what happens I find with um, addiction like we we make it all, all about the addict and, and they've got their stuff to work out but it, we have our own stuff to, to deal with so I told him I had to sort of make a little bit of a separation I said I'm getting caught up in your roller coaster and I can't do that so I'll see you in a couple of months when you've had some rehab. Because mm. until then, I, I can't be a part of this. And it's been hard for him, um, but I have to stand my ground. 
So that's that's where I come to this uh, to this work from. That's, that was my journey. Um, tough, but it's been very good for me. Mm. How about you, Adam? So, for me, dealing with um, addiction is something that is something that I've been addressing, whether consciously or unconsciously, my whole life. So I grew up in a family uh, with uh, with two addicts. Uh, my father was an alcoholic, is an alcoholic, and uh, my brother, as he got older, developed uh, an addiction to heroin. Mm. And so uh, they've kind of had two very different trajectories uh, when it comes to substance abuse. My dad, uh, for all uh, for all I know, is a lifelong alcoholic, and uh, th one of the hardest things about being in a relationship with him is I realized, like I had a very Hollywood idea of what alcoholism looks like. Alcoholism is to me, to me was like falling down, uh, slurring your words, like wrecking your car a bunch of times and stuff like that. And my dad was actually is actually a very functional alcoholic. Uh, you know, he was a he, he had a, a long career, no, and I, I just figured that you couldn't do that kind of stuff and, and, and have a 40-year career. Um, and so I, I, I never really knew, I, as I was growing up, like he'd have, much like your dad, how he struggled with anger management and things like that, that's how he, ex that's how, over time, I realized that those were the moments where he was drunk. Uh, he would be, he'd, he'd have these weird lashes of anger, at like weird times of the night and stuff like that. And that's kind of, I learned to deal with that as a kid and as a teenager. And um, and I started to be able to distance myself from it as I got out of my home and you know grew up and got my own place and got a job and stuff. Uh, but I never really realized it uh, that clearly until he had a really bad episode um, not all that long ago. I mean, I kind of was aware of his drinking, but I, I rationalized it away. That's one of the things that uh, as an adult child of an alcoholic, I. I and many people like me tend to do is we rationalize away behaviors. Uh, <laughs> and um, about uh, in November of 2019, uh, I got a call from my mom and she said, something's wrong with dad. I, you know, I, I couldn't get him to wake up this morning and we had to take him to the hospital. And, um, and I had to go home. I had to fly home to Arizona and, and be with my family. And he had, been, he had had a couple of bad episodes of drinking and where there were some bad health ramifications and he basically almost killed himself mm. uh, drinking. And the blessing in disguise of that moment for us as a family was, um, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about the idea behind the work that we do to, to deal, to live with and love the addicts in our family is he kind of hit his rock bottom moment. He kind of really hit that moment where he, he realized very clearly he needed to change for himself. Um, and so thankfully, uh, he, we just got off the phone yesterday and he, he just last week celebrated 10 months of sobriety, which That's is great, awesome. Thank God. Um, my, my brother's, uh, my, my brother's only two, uh, three years younger than I am and his trajectory when it comes to substance use was very, was much more abrupt than his. My, my dad was dealing with drinking for, uh, 55, 60 years. My brother, uh, much like a lot of teenagers in his teenage years kind of was experimenting with you know drinking and, and smoking weed and stuff like that and over time as he developed relationships with people who use drugs more regularly became exposed and started using black tar heroin and that really kind of it, it was a really remarkable shift in him it was one day he was kind of like this fun loving freewheeling guy and then the next day he's breaking into my apartment and stealing my laptop and uh, and uh, nodding out behind the wheel of a car and stuff like that and he he is starting to do a lot better um, and and I've also discovered that in loving and living with people who are addicts those types of addicts an alcoholic and a drug addict have are very different animals they're very different monsters to deal with and so uh, I one of the big decisions I made was once my brother really started having a hard time with his sobriety and with drug use as I got into a program called Naranon, which is how, which is you are the family member or a loved one of somebody who has a drug dependency issue. And then as my, my dad's alcoholism got worse and worse, I became more heavily involved in Al-Anon work, which is the sister program to AA, which is uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. So Al-Anon um, Al is for loved ones of, of alcoholics. and. So I try to regularly go to meetings. It's been a little bit more difficult in this kind of COVID era that we live in. So a lot of them are conference calls and stuff like that. But um, that that's kind of been the, the path of it. 
uh, it's it has not been super di super easy you know um, with my dad it's been really good to see him do the work I was kind of sharing with Rick when we were talking about this idea that um, my dad got has gotten so into his sobriety that uh, my mom almost is like she's like I don't I don't really see him anymore which I guess is kind of a good thing that he is sober and alive <laughs> you know sure. so um, but my brother is still on a little bit of a different path you know he can do well for a while and then he seems to have some struggles and um, and we're going to talk more about how we deal with those things but uh, one of the things I stopped doing was asking uh, you know much like instead of me traveling my car through the streets of Toronto I'm driving around in my brain trying to come up with ways to catch him in a lie about drug use and stuff and I really just had to start not getting in the car in my brain uh, mm -hmm. you know and uh, and it's been hard uh, him and I I mean th a lot of dealing with uh, the effects of addiction in families and in, and in our loved ones is uh, trying to destigmatize it a little bit and and talk more openly and honestly about it uh, my brother and I haven't had an actual conversation with one another text phone call anything in uh, about a year and a half and that is by choice partially for me for my own sanity and uh, and partially by him to because he doesn't want to talk to me or whatever his decision is and I can't spin my wheels about that um, so a lot of it becomes how do we start living healthier lives as well because when it comes to sobriety whether it's the addict or those of us who love the addict it becomes how do we reclaim our sanity that was the that was the biggest thing that jumped out to me when I started doing 12-step work with Al-Anon is I'm not insane uh, I thought it was two, it was twofold. First of all, uh, I thought that the way that I grew up and the way that I interacted with my family members, that just like everybody's life was like this. And when I figured out that people's lives weren't like that, I was like, what happened? How, what? And so it was, it was addressing that. But two, once you realize that you're not insane, you know, reclaiming your sanity for yourself, um, was really good and and it's hard because i mean we'll talk about it more it's some of that disassociation mm -hmm. you know learning to to put some space um but that was kind of, that's kind of the journey thus far uh so well you talked about destigmatizing addiction and i think it's it's one of the really important things and and our our, our catholic faith and our spirituality uh, and especially franciscan spirituality uh, addresses that you know that each and every one of us is uh, built in the image and likeness of god we are ch children of god and uh, there is no, nothing that we can do that can separate us from God's love. The other part is that Franciscan vision that St. Francis talked about in the Canticle of the Creatures in which Pope Francis has illustrated in his encyclical Laudato Si, where all of creation and all the elements of creation are interdependent. And the people in our lives, we, we are interdependent with them. It's a, it's, a, it's a system, right? And social work and, and psychology will tell us that we live in social systems and families are systems, networks of relationships. And um, systems um, are like the environment, right? They like to stay balanced. We call that homeostasis. Everything needs to stay the same. And um, when something happens that throws the family system off key it's like if you have a, a stool and one of the legs is shorter and it throws it off well the rest of the stool has to has to adapt to balance things out and so when somebody develops addiction then the whole family is affected it's not just their problem all of us are affected and we change and adapt to stabilize the family and um, that's how it we have to see that it's a it's something that affects all of us and so family counseling, family therapy, family health is super important. The other thing to remember is uh, this is not a moral issue. Mm. Someone who is an addict or an alcoholic is not more sinful than you or me. They are, alcoholism addiction is a disease. Some of it is more substance-based and has uh, chemical re reactions in your body. Some of it is more compulsive behavior, like we talk about addiction to gambling or to pornography. There are neurological elements. And, and so basically a lot of it has to do with how we experience pleasure, right? So certain behaviors or substances will make us feel good and 
our brain will become rewired to some degree uh, and we will only enjoy and get pleasure by doing that behavior or that substance. And unfortunately, it's, it's, it's insidious because you always need more and more of that to feel good. Um, in fact, I, I mean, I would say that a lot of people who use drugs, um, <laughs> in a weird way, it's a healthy sign. Mm. In a way that they're, they're feeling pain in their life and they want to medicate it. They're feeling a hollowness, um, a, a sense of despair. Something's wrong, right? And you often associate uh, addictive behavior with people who've had traumas in their lives, um, especially sexual abuse or, or abuse of any kind. And so they try to numb their feelings and, and, and want to feel good. Um, sometimes it comes from, from an injury where um, you take this medication and it's like, wow, mm. I feel great. And you just want that feeling that high again. So it's important not to judge not to moralize they're not weaker than we are there's not them and us we are we're, we're, it's just human beings right so i think uh, taking away that kind of moral thing is is very important mm -hmm. and it happens to everyone okay um the, among the friars you would not believe how many over the time that i've been a friar 38 years how many friars have have gone to aa or to counseling or to treatment for primarily alcoholism, but other addictions as well. It happens to bishops, priests, it happens to married people, single people, men and women, young and old. Nobody is immune from it. And so it's not, it's not a sin to have an addiction. Mm -hmm. It is a medical reality. Right. Um, and that was one of the, like one, when I started addressing this within myself, uh, somebody said to me, if you had cancer, you would tell a doctor. You like like if somebody told you you had cancer, you'd go work with a doctor. You don't stigmatize um, any kind of injury. Like if you had a broken leg, nobody would be like, "Oh, you broke your leg, huh? How long have you been breaking your leg for?" It, it's the same thing that we deal with with addiction. Is if we can learn to destigmatize it and and realize that there are neurological and medical and genealogical issues that all contribute. To addiction itself then we start to better understand the person that we're dealing with and that's the most important thing like like you're saying that this is a person that we're dealing with we're not dealing with a bunch of symptoms we're not dealing with um, really even a sin issue we're dealing with the entirety of the human person um, and for me it was it that that's really important to me because for the longest especially in dealing with my brother who exhibited criminal behavior associated with his addiction i got really up on my high horse about it you know not only just not only as a person who um works within the church and likes to try and filter things into the lens of like your your sinning or things like that but you know I, I was a person who was being directly hurt and affected by it um and when i started to learn about all those things that you mentioned that go into addiction uh, it made it a lot easier for me to not only love him, even if it's from a distance, but also start to do some healing on my own. Sure. Because sure. that's a big part of it too, is it's not just how can we help you, because I would say 10 times out of 10, there's nothing we can really do to help the addicts in our lives. It's 100% about how do we uh, heal ourselves. You know, and for me specifically, as I'm doing this work, it's me also realizing and relearning how to be a husband and a father being raised by an alcoholic because, you know, we all have these, and I'm speaking very specifically to, to married people with kids, but we all, I think, have these moments where we're like, oh, my, this parent did this, I'm never gonna be like them. And I'm not an alcoholic. I'm, I, don't, I don't have a problem with drinking. I'm not an addict in the same way that my dad is. But I also realize that I exhibit some of his behaviors and traits that are directly, I believe, through counseling and, and working my program, attributed to his addiction. Yeah. You know, like uh, like I will lose my temper really easily. Now I'm not a, I'm not an alcoholic, but when I was raised, when I was in a home with somebody who their their rage and their anger was fueled by alcohol so readily. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm, I am, you know, we all have that moment, we're like, oh my God, I'm becoming my dad. 
or I'm becoming my mom, I started becoming my dad. And that's when I really started to focus in on that, that back end work on my own because um, I have somebody I know who talks about a lot about this thing. This, if, if you look at it through a spiritual lens, the idea of what we would call like a generational curse. Mm -hmm. And these things that follow us down from generation to generation to generation, learned behaviors that, uh, that for those of us who are learning to love our addicts and ourselves, we have to unpack and, un and unwork some of that. And it becomes lifelong work for me. For especially. sure. And the generational piece is very real, right? Yeah. So there is a genetic predisposition to addiction and, and alcoholism, especially. Uh, and uh, as, a, as a priest who's also a psychotherapist, I've seen that, you know. Um, and uh, you can also see adult children of, co of alcoholics and, and their behaviors, right? So people who... Um, have, have been in a home with, with an alcoholic, like I said, try to stabilize the family and especially the eldest child will try to be the rescuer and fix mm -hmm. everything and the partner to the spouse that's not alcoholic. And so will become super highly vigilant, hy hyper effective, very, very effective and everything has to be perfect, everything has to be done well and they become really overachievers, right? Um, very controlling usually and you can spot those you know and I often would do that with sometimes with bride, brides and grooms when one of the, the two of them would be I could see we're sensing where we're, we're going to try to fix their spouse or future spouse mm -hmm. and they and they had a tendency to be everything perfect and very high high uh, anxiety and I would say you know was one of your parents alcoholic and they'd be like how did you know that <laughs> so, well it's kind of obvious um, so I think the key again is, first of all, just be gentle with yourself and with others, right? Uh, especially the person facing the addiction. Um, in terms of, of their journey, um, I think the, the, probably the most important resource um, that has uh, ever come across for, for alcoholism is AA, Alcoholics Anonymous. And this is the, the big blue book, the big book of, uh, AA, and it's basically uh, some basic a basic philosophy, and then stories of how people uh, cope with their addiction. And it was started by a name, name a guy named Bill Wilson, and um, there were some priests involved as well. And um, what is remarkable about this of, about AA is that it's not about getting sober; mm. it's about becoming holy and whole. Uh, when I was teaching counseling at uh, the Toronto School of Theology, I would ask my uh, seminarian students and lay students to go to a 12-step meeting. So, you know, it's not just AA anymore. It's, you know, uh, al -Anon, it's a uh, Narcanon. Uh, there's different types of 12-step meetings. I would tell them, go to any meeting and observe. And because if you're going to be as a pastoral minister or as a priest telling people to go to AA, you should know what you're sending them to. Mm. So inevitably, they'd be reticent to go, and then they'd come back and present their, their term paper, and they were shocked at how spiritual it was. Mm -hmm. and, it, and that's really the success of, of AA. It is a spiritual journey. Sobriety, in terms of not drinking, is only part of the journey. It's reclaiming your life and finding where you fit in the whole scheme of God, right? that we are not God, we are not in control, mm. that God is the creator, we're the creature, and being able to live with the, in the present moment, to be grateful for the gifts of God. I mean, Francis of Assisi, that was his own journey because you know, he wanted to take control of his life and become a knight and become rich and become this, and then he lost it all and realized, what am I chasing after? Mm. And I think that's where the, uh, the addict or the alcoholic is confronted in in AA or 12 step to say, what am I chasing after? What is gonna, what is really gonna fill that hole in my heart? Mm -hmm. what, is it gonna, what is gonna fulfill me? So the number one thing I would recommend to people is 12 step. How, how do you feel about it? I, I, I absolutely agree, not only for the addicts in our lives and like making the recommendation, uh, but also for us, you know, and a lot of times it, it takes a little bit of work and a little bit of, uh, prayer and meditation on the idea that we also have to do work 
to reach and, and again when we when we use this term holiness or, or wholeness it's not about becoming like uh, an angel with a halo it's about realizing that um, from a theological perspective we are all desiring and seeking oneness with God because that's where we find real peace we find real joy that lasts uh, and that's what the program works that like for me you'll see that there are similarities if you ever pursue 12 step work you'll see the similarities in an AA meeting and an Al-Anon meeting where we talk about the whole realizing that we have a problem is that there is something in our lives that we cannot control and we have to turn that over to a higher power we turn it over to God um, and you know and like you said there are some very spiritual elements of 12-step work every 12-step meeting I've ever been to and this is my own experience uh, at some point whoever if you're willing to it's always being very open and gentle uh, if you're willing to uh, praying the serenity prayer is part of it and praying the Our Father is part of it and really that all just again comes back to the idea of surrendering control that I don't have control over these things but if I can give that control to God I start to like I said before reclaim my sanity that I don't have to keep spinning my wheels to try and catch up um, interesting fact yeah. the serenity prayer if, the, there's a serenity prayer that most people know and it's the shorter version mm -hmm. of it but the complete version of it actually talks about Jesus mm -hmm. and so it, it, the grounding is very very faith based but some people don't like that right you know and and not everybody can work with with 12 step so uh, there are a couple of other things that are really um, helpful um, one is uh, and this is very common in um, secular or city run kind of programs it's called harm reduction so it's a it's a it's a, a way an intervention that social workers counselors physicians uh, healthcare professionals do with a person who's who's addicted and they basically help them make choices that will reduce the harmful impact of their addiction so for example one of the more controversial ones if somebody is using needles to inject uh, drugs um, they might be using reusing needles from that they've used before that might be dirty or other people's needles and and be using be catching diseases so one of the things you would do is provide needles so you're not encouraging them to use the needles right. but if you're going to do it anyways at least have a clean needle so you don't get um, hepatitis c or hiv or some other uh, uh, infection um, the same thing like doing it in a safe space doing it in a controlled environment there's also medications like methadone that people can take instead of uh, certain drugs to help them manage their uh, addictive behavior mm -hmm. in a healthier way you're still giving them a substance that doesn't give them the same high but you're transferring the dependency to something that is uh, less damaging right and again this is not ideal but in the world of addiction we never deal with none of us are ideal mm -hmm. so you manage the the addiction as best you can another approach to um, to dealing with addiction is cognitive behavior behavioral therapy so a lot of what happens with addiction some of it is biological mm. a lot of it is in our heads right and whether it's depression anxiety most a lot of uh, mental health issues can be helped greatly by changing the way we think about life and our thoughts sometimes lead us to do things that are not healthy mm. and so cognitive behavioral therapy is basically helping us to reframe our thinking and from that to change our behavior mm. to do better uh, another part of that which is very helpful is motivational interviewing that's an approach to therapy where you um, you don't focus on the negative like let's say somebody um, is trying to avoid drugs and relapses it, relapse means they use again after a, a time of sobriety so in motivational interviewing you wouldn't see that as a relapse you'd reframe it or rename it as a rehearsal mm. you know like every time you mess up well you're not really messing up you're 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 preparing yourself for greater success or you can use that mistake as a as a building block for success um, that takes a lot of care to be able to 
and a lot of energy to always be there for the people we love and to help build them up and say, well, next time, what, what can we learn from this? How do we do better? That's better left to um, professionals because it can be very exhausting to always be the one who is building up, right? Um, I'd say the, the number one thing uh, in terms of the you know 12 step motivational interviewing, harm reduction, and there's lots of other approaches, counseling approaches, is that as the loved one, we want to distance ourselves a little bit. Not distance our heart, we can still love the person and care about them, but we sh probably shouldn't be the one trying to fix it mm. because then we get into our own mm -hmm. dysfunction. Right, and that's, there isn't something that's not loving about providing safe boundaries and distance from the people in our lives that um, that addiction has caused us to be affected by. Um, it was hard for me to realize that for me to ever have a healthy relationship with my loved ones again, I'm not gonna be able to see them every day. And really what that came down to for me in my own experience is if I don't see you every day, there are less opportunities for me to activate that thing in me because I am the oldest child, I'm the fixer, right? So when dad's having a hard time and he's struggling with sobriety or my brother's having a hard time or he's struggling with sobriety, my natural impulse is I have to go fix this. And then I get lost in this rabbit hole of providing solutions and that's not my job. Um, <laughs> well, I can so relate to it. Uh, the the, the rabbit hole of finding solutions, right? It's like oh, yeah. we are the most creative fixers of the situation. But And the other thing that's really, really important, specifically for me, if I could offer a point of advice, and again, I don't know how much that aligns with the 12-step mentality or philosophy, but if I could provide a piece of advice, the number one thing that I heard, and I didn't hear this until several months of going to 12-step meetings, is... Uh, I, I, I was getting frustrated and you know in, in most 12 step meetings you're sharing from your own perspective you don't talk about other people's experiences you talk about your own and I got really frustrated because I went into this with the expectation in my own head that somewhere along the line someone in the room is going to give me the solution to fix the addict in my life and there is not one you're not going to get it you're not gonna get it from him, you're not gonna get it from a therapist or a 12-step program. There's no solution for us as the loved ones of people who struggle with sobriety to fix their, to give them sobriety. Mm -hmm. There's no pill that we can give them, there's no scripture that they can read, there's no, th that's not what's gonna happen. We don't have that ability. It's us making sure that we're doing the work to live healthy lives and being as loving and supportive as we can as they try and do the same. Well, yeah, it's like one of my friends was said to me, oh my God, I'm losing my mind with this addiction. Can you just chain me to a radiator and leave me in the attic for a month? And I said, if it would work, I would gladly, but it's not gonna work. You can chain somebody to the radiator take all the booze away, take all the drugs away, and have them there for four, five, six months. It'll get out of their system, but they will not have addressed the underlying issue, and they will go back to it as soon as they can, mm -hmm. unless they confront it mm -hmm. and deal with their own addiction. Yeah. Another thing that was really helpful for me uh, is, and you addressed it earlier, and it was something that I was wildly not familiar with until I started really exploring what working on myself actually meant in the context of living and loving um, an addict is addressing codependency and what codependency actually is and one of the resources that i found really helpful that rick actually has is there's a book uh, called codependent no more and you will read this and it is not a comedy but you will laugh a lot because you're going to read things in this and say how does how do they know me so well because you're going to hear and read things that are exactly things that you have said or done in your own life. Yeah, I, it, there are two of these books, Beyond Codependency and Codependent No More. The first, I mean, they're by Melody Beattie. Mm -hmm. The first time I read it, I, like you, I was howling. It's like, oh my God, how do they know this? <laughs> this is me. This is what I've experienced, right? And um, she gives you a lot of good advice. 
uh, on how to basically you got to deal with your own stuff. You know, if you find yourself, you're trying to solve your son's or your daughter's problems and trying to and it's not just addiction. Right. But if 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 they've made choices in life that are not healthy and are not smart and they're they're caught up maybe in somebody else's addiction or whatever or in choices of, of life that are not healthy and you're going around fixing it mm. and you're getting more and more tired and exhausted and perhaps even angry okay that is it's time to read this book um, everything isn't solved by a book mm. but once your eyes are open to it at least when, when the, my eyes were open to what I was doing and I realized hey I'm not crazy I'm not alone this is a reaction to an unhealthy situation and I realized I don't want to do this anymore mm. I want off of this roller coaster oh it is such a relief so um, reading this going to codependence anonymous anonymous al-anon are some of the key things i think it's important to do mm -hmm. um and the two again points of advice that that helped me when it came to al-anon uh a lot of times when you go to your first meeting uh, somebody in the room will say something to the effect of go to uh, six meetings in six weeks mm -hmm. and give it a try um, because there is an element of you talked about the wiring in our brains mm -hmm. for us as the loved ones of addicts there is a period of time where we are rewiring our brain because um, there is a, uh, a ritualistic element to substance use there's something that like i can do this and i know i can come here because this is where i feel safe you know like in, in talking with my brother he shared with me a lot of the reason the re he didn't use he doesn't use drugs because he likes how it feels he uses them because he doesn't want to feel sick and he doesn't he wants to feel normal i am sick when i when i try and dive into this codependency and, and, and this madness of trying to solve the sobriety of my loved ones and that period of time of going to a lot of meetings and a lot of time in a, in a short period of time or whatever is me starting to uncross the wires mm -hmm. in my brain uh, to, again, I talk about regaining my sanity. I start reclaiming my sanity little by little. Um, the other thing too is especially if, if you're coming at life from the perspective of somebody who believes in Jesus, there can sometimes, you will sometimes be meet people who have an objection to 12 step work because they think it's not spiritual enough or it, it's contrary to church teaching and that's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. Um, I mean, first of all, it's, it's, it's an acknowledgement of God himself. It's acknowledging that God is the author of all things and can provide us health and sanity um, and wholeness. But I mean, prayer is a part of it. Now- oh, And a priest was part of founding it, yeah. Right. And, and I mean, and, and part of it will become as like in my journey going through Al-Anon, I met people who objected to praying the Lord's Prayer as a part of it. Okay, that's okay. If you're not Christian, yeah. And, and again, for me, as, as doing the things that I have done, like working within the church for the last 16 years, my natural tendency is, can I talk to you about Jesus? And like, can I make this all in the perspective? And like, I, it was good because I found I didn't have to do that there. It's a place where I can go and I can be angry or I can be sad or I can say nothing or I can yeah. say everything and it's really good because it just stays there it's almost like being able to sh it's like a reverse Pandora's box you just get to shout all the stuff into the box and shut it and it stays there yeah so I guess the other thing I wanted to talk about was you know when you're faced with um, somebody who's out of control with addictions and uh, you're in a relationship with them uh, beyond going to a, an Al-Anon meeting it's setting boundaries sort of realizing that there's a distinction between you and the other person and saying, I don't want to live like this anymore. Mm. And if you continue to do this or that, um, I can't have you, A, living in my house. I can't be in relationship with you. Um, you can't work here, whatever. But I think it's really for your own health and, 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 and sanity, you have to set your boundaries. And enforce them and that sucks and it hurts and it's very difficult and you really will not be successful in doing it unless you go get help for yourself as well because right. you, we all want to love these people but we, we sometimes love them the wrong way. Mm -hmm.
don't be afraid of doing the work. You know, um, don't carry. Um, I know it's easier said than done, but one of the things that I can say from my own experience is, let go of the pain and the guilt of getting help. You know, uh, getting into therapy, pursuing twelve step work, you sh uh, establishing healthy boundaries for yourself, for your family members, for your kids. Those things are important. And remember that just because we have to engage in the work of distancing and um, and getting help, that doesn't mean that the relationship is done forever. You know, uh, I still have a, a really good relationship with my dad, even though there was a lot of damage that had to get undone. Uh, so those boundaries are good and they can help lead back to healthy relationships. Sure. Uh, I think that one of the things that will be helpful is we're going to leave links in the description below on the video and at the end of the video at the title card so that you can see links to resources uh, for you guys, for anybody who's interested to get help. Uh, and we just encourage you uh, to do that. Yeah. Also, if you're in central New York, uh, the book is available at the Franciscan Place at right. Destiny USA. Probably could get it cheaper and faster at Amazon as well. But uh, if you want to come down and visit us at uh, the Franciscan Place, we'd love that. In the meantime, that's Tao Talks for this month. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Adam. Thanks so much for having um, And thank you to all of you for listening and for caring. And, and uh, let's continue to pray for one another and pray for our loved ones who struggle. Uh, we're all in this together. We are one community of faith. And uh, yeah, we're, we're, it, it takes a lot of loving to, uh, to get through it. Have a great month. See you next month. Thanks, guys.